Ezekiel. For this is what the Lord God says. See, I myself will search for my flock and look for them. As a, as a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock, so I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on the day of clouds and total darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples, gather them from the countries, and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all inhibited places of the land. I will tend them in good pasture, and their grazing place will be on Israel's lofty mountains. There they will lie down in a good grazing place, and they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, and strengthen the weak. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with my justice. The book of Matthew. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he, find, when he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. This is the word of God for the children of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I know the illustration I'm giving you right now is the wrong time of year. Because I want to talk about garage sales. And it's just been too hot for garage sales. So not many people are having them. But you know, I always think of garage sales right after Easter, in the early spring. Is that when, is that garage sale season? Because I mean, you see, all of a sudden, every street corner's got a sign with an address, garage sale. And as you're driving around, if you're out and about on a Saturday morning, you get to a garage, you go by a garage sale, and you see a group of cars there. A little while later, you happen to go down another block, and there's another garage sale, and the same cars are there. And all of a sudden, you find out there's a group of people who wake up early on a Saturday morning, and their desire is to hit as many garage sales as they can, and find as many bargains as they can, and they go from place to place to place, trying to find all the good stuff before everybody else gets there. I have no idea what they're doing with all the stuff they buy, but they're eager to get out there and buy all that stuff. And so I guess the old adage is true. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Well, she's okay. Not going to hurt me any. <laughs> because if, when you're getting ready for a garage sale, what is it you put out on the tables and, and, in the, and around in your driveway? Do you put your best stuff? Do you put your stuff that you, are, you treasure most of all? Don't you put the stuff you don't want anymore? The stuff you could care less about? The stuff you just want to get rid of? It's, it's not valuable to you. And yet there are people who are eager to come and get it. And then when the garage sale is over and you shut down, what do you do with all the leftover stuff? You don't want it. It was out in the garage sale because you didn't want it in your house. And now you got all this stuff you don't have to do with. You either throw it in the dumpster, give it away, or, you know, or box it up till the next garage sale. One man's trash can be another man's treasure. That's a sad reality. Today we start a new sermon series entitled Pursuing God. Now, pursuing God is a big topic. There are a lot of books written about pursuing God. And they're what I would typically call kind of Christian self-help books, what it means to pursue God in the right way. The really books on Christian discipleship, what it means to live as a Christian. But there's a problem. There are times when I pursue God, and the more I pursue, the farther away He feels. There are times when I feel kind of like the leftovers of a yard sale, unwanted, useless, of no value to anyone or anything. And usually I feel that way when I put myself in the driver's seat that I'm going to be about the relationship with God. What I want you to see 
in this series of messages that it's not about us pursuing God, that pursuing God is a reality of who He is, that He is a pursuing God, and that He's the God who's searching for us. And he does not look at us as the leftovers that are of no value. He does not see us as people who are worthless. We have to stop seeing ourselves through other people's eyes. We have to stop looking and saying, what does that person think of me? And what value do they place on me? Because the value of how another person values you is irrelevant And we even have to stop listening to ourselves, the value we place on ourselves. We have to start seeing ourselves through God's eyes. The value His heart places on us. Because He is pursuing us because we are of value to Him. In the parable that Jesus told, and it is one of the shortest parables in the Bible, the parable of the pearl of great price, He says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Now, I don't know how many times you've heard that parable expounded, taught, preached, whatever, but usually it goes something like this. A merchant is searching for pearls like we would search for the kingdom of heaven. And when you find that one great pearl... You sell everything and buy it. That's what the merchant does. That when you have the kingdom of heaven, it is worth more than anything else you could ever have. Is that true? Well, absolutely that's true. Having the kingdom of God is worth everything. But the problem is the interpretation of that passage is backwards. In the passage, it says the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. The kingdom of heaven is the merchant. The kingdom of heaven, God, is the one searching. God is the one searching for what is of value. And so when the kingdom of heaven, God, is searching and finds the pearl of great price, that is you, He is willing to spare no expense, to pay every or any price, to make any sacrifice to have you as His own. You see, you are the one that is valuable to the heart of God. God is, in a sense, on a quest, on a journey. It began in the garden with Adam and Eve. God came into the garden, and what did He say? Adam, where are you? Did He know where Adam was at? He's God. He knows everything. But you see what's going on. God came, they ran. He called, they hid. You see a pattern? God called to them and they were hiding. God was running after them as they were running away. God was the one pursuing because He is a pursuing God. He was coming to them not in judgment, not in condemnation. He was coming to them in love, seeking to restore what their sin had destroyed. And we see this throughout the entire history of the Old Testament, of the world, in a sense. God pursuing those who are running away. It started with Moses. I'm sorry, it started with, with Adam in the garden. But then you see God pursuing and calling over and over again. He called to Cain, but to no avail because Cain wouldn't listen. Cain hardened his heart to what God was calling him for. He called to Noah. Noah listened, and because him, humanity was was saved, but all the rest perished. He called Abraham, and Abraham listened and answered his call, and Abraham had a unique relationship with God. He trusted God. He had faith in God and believed Him. But when Abraham's descendants ended up in Egypt as slaves, crying out, God called Moses. And what did Moses do? He delivered the people out of bondage. And through Moses, God did something different. God set up a group of people, priests, who were to lead the people in their relationship with God. They failed. They failed to lead the people in their relationship because they weren't concerned about relationship. They wanted to follow the rules. 
They wanted everyone to jump through the hoops. They liked the rules, and as we talked about in, in Sunday school this morning, religion is so much easier than relationship. Religion, just follow the rules. If you've done everything you're supposed to do, you're good. Relationships are messy. Relationships are hard. Relationships are give and take. Relationships are, you know, are, are challenging at times. Relationships meaning, mean saying, I'm sorry at times. Forgive me. Religion's easy. And the priests were much more concerned about religion than relationship, even though God had established the priesthood to lead the people in their relationship with God. Over the years through the Old Testament, you see it time and time again. God would call and some would answer. And for a season, for maybe a generation, the people would live in relationship with God. But the successive generation would turn away and forget him and walk away again. And those who were chosen to lead the people, the priests, the spiritual leaders failed time and time again. But God never stopped pursuing, never stopped calling, never stopped yearning to rescue his people. In the Old Testament, there are a few times in which God reveals his heart and how he feels about these religious leaders who had become self-righteous. And he has hard words to say to them. Now, I want you to understand something real quick, just as an aside. There, without a relationship with God, without really understanding God's love and desire to be in a relationship with you, people default, default to one of two options. Either self-loathing or self-righteousness. You get that? Self-loathing, I'm not worth anything. I'm unlovable. Self-righteousness, I'm okay because I'm better than you, and if I'm better than you, I feel good about myself. Self-loathing and self-righteousness are the two options that people have. And you know what? Both those selves come to church. Self-loathing sits right back there in the corner trying to be invisible. Self-righteousness usually comes right up front and wants to be seen by everybody. And you know what Jesus says to both the selves? Self-loathing and self-righteousness? You can't live here. This is not a place for you. It's not that the church of Jesus Christ is somewhere that you're not wanted. You are wanted. Everybody's wanted. But you can't exist here. Because self-loathing and self-righteousness have no place in a relationship with God. And the church is not about rules and religion. The church is about relationship. And so God has something to say to the self-righteous, those who, were, who would enforce the rules and standards and stuff. And God has something to say to the self-loathing, those who feel they are worthless and have no place, that they're unlovable and unwanted. Ezekiel is one such place. Ezekiel is called by God to speak to both, to the self-righteous leaders who set up the rules and standards that you have to meet to be acceptable. And you know what's sad? Churches still do that today. Churches still, you know, have this unwritten rule book you have to follow, these standards you have to meet. And if you've jumped through all the hoops and you meet all the standards, you're good. But if you don't, what happens? You can't be here. You know, we have to follow what God wants us to do, and you're not doing that, so you can't stay here. Bye. How many people have left churches hurt? grieving because they've been made to feel less than, unwanted and unloved, because they couldn't meet the standard. You know what? God doesn't have standards like that. God's about a relationship with you. And so when he speaks through Ezekiel, he speaks very strong, pointed words that are life-changing words to the self-righteous and the self-loathing. I want you to hear the first section here. This is what the Lord God says, Behold, I am against the shepherds. 
the self-righteous, the priests that were to lead the people in relationship but didn't. I'm against the shepherds. I will demand my sheep from them, and I will take and will make them stop tending sheep. So the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore, but I have saved my sheep from their mouths, and they will not be food for them. Horrible image. But what's he saying? The self-righteous, the leaders, are devouring my people. You see, the priests have become fat and happy. They're well-fed and well-dressed. The spiritual leaders look down their nose and see themselves as better than the, the weak, the sick. They ignore the orphan and the widows. They despise the poor. They thought they were just a little bit better than everybody else. And if you could play their game and meet their standard and follow their rules, then you were better than others as well. And you could feel good about yourself. You could be self-righteous. He says, I have no use for you. I have no use for you. Your service to God is done. It's over. But he has a whole different way of dealing with the self-loathing. Those who felt they were unworthy. I want to share something with you this morning. I know we have a lot of little distractions running around this morning, and that's okay. I love it. But it's, I know it's hard to track sometimes. So if you get nothing else out of this message today, get this, okay? Everybody pay attention for one minute. If you get nothing else, listen to this. When Jesus came into this world, God in human flesh, he had two ways of dealing with people. Only two. He had a way he dealt with the self-loathing and a way he dealt with the self-righteous. To the self-loathing, to the people who believed they were unworthy, unlovable, unwanted, Jesus had a simple way of dealing with this. He came to them. He's pursuing them. He came to them and he, he loved them. He accepted them. He forgave them. And he encouraged them to move forward knowing they were loved by God. And because of that, their life would be different. Do you understand that? He came to them, and he loved them, he accepted them, he forgave them, and he sent them forth into the future with a different understanding of who they were. They were loved by God and wanted by God. Simple way of dealing with those who were told they weren't worth anything. But the self-righteous, he spoke only words of judgment. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. They're whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. You look so good on the outside, but inside you make me sick. That's the only two ways he dealt with people. Judgment upon the self-righteous and absolute love and acceptance and forgiveness for those who are told they were of no value. This is how Jesus dealt with people. So to the self-righteous, the religious leaders, those who thought they were better than others, he said, you're done. But listen to the rest of the Ezekiel passage. He says, I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord. I will seek the lost, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, strengthen the weak, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. What does he say to those who were downtrodden, to those who had nothing? He says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to come. God was promising the day is going to come when he is going to enter into this world. And he's going to shepherd his people. He will be the good shepherd. He will shepherd them not like the religious leaders they've had. But he will shepherd them in justice. In much the same way, that God entered into the garden calling to Adam and Eve to enter back into the relationship they'd walked away from. Jesus entered into this world, into creation itself, for the purpose of calling us back into a relationship. We didn't have to go to God. God, as a pursuing God, came to us, searching for us, calling us, reaching out to us, helping us understand His heart and the value He places on us. And the truth is that what you need to understand is Jesus is willing to meet you where you are at. Do you understand that? 
You don't have to change a thing in your life. I used to be a comedian years ago. He used to say, do you get cleaned up to take a bath? That doesn't make any sense. Do you get cleaned up to take a bath? You don't get cleaned up to take a bath. You, don't, you, can't, you can't even change anything to enter into a relationship with God. He comes to you just as you are. And he's coming to you. And he accepts you just where you are at. You don't have to change anything. You also don't have to hide. Because he knows where you're at. When he entered into the garden, did he know what Adam and Eve had done? Absolutely. Do you know where they're at? Absolutely. He comes to you in all of your brokenness, in all your failures, in all your hurts. He comes to you, and he accepts you where you're at. He loves you. He forgives you, and he changes your life. You don't believe that? Who are you? Some have marriages that are teetering on the edge of destruction. It doesn't worry him. Some spend more money than they should on alcohol. Some spend everything they have on drugs. Some turn on the computer and find the the first porn page that comes up. Some of you live with hurt. You've loved someone who hurt you in return because they don't know how to love and they've made you feel absolutely worthless, of no value at all. You see, the circumstances of your life don't scare Jesus. He comes to you. And understand, your drug use, alcohol use doesn't offend him. Your sexuality doesn't make him blush. If you're drunk and sick with a hangover, he'll kneel beside you and hold back your hair while you're sick. If you're poor, he's not asking for anything. If you're hungry, he has more than enough to share. He simply wants you. And he's pursuing you because he loves you. Do you understand? You're not the leftovers He wasn't searching for a bargain at a yard sale. He looks at you and says, you're what I want. In fact, if God could speak to you, he'd say, the moment I saw you, I loved you. The moment I set my eyes upon you, I wanted you. And there was nothing in my heart, nothing that I would not give to have you as my own. And so I sent Jesus the very best that I have, the highest price I could pay, I sent Jesus for you. That's how much he loves you. That's how much he wants you. And if you let him, whether it's the woman caught in adultery, the tax collectors, all those you see him interacting with in Scripture, he'll interact with you in the same way. He'll come to you And he will love you. He will accept you for who you are right where you are at. Don't change a thing. He will forgive you. And you can walk forward into your life with a different understanding of who you are. Not what the world says about you. Not even what you say about yourself. But what God says about you. The value he places on you. The value of his heart and his love. And you will walk forth into the future with the confidence of knowing that Jesus goes with you. He'll open the way before you and show you day by day, moment by moment, everything you can become. And when your journey in this world is over, he will find great pleasure in helping you understand what is in store for you for eternity. And on that day, he will be celebrating He'll be celebrating because his quest has come to an end. His journey is over because what has been his desire? Everything he has done has been done for one reason, that you can be with him forever. And in the day you enter into eternity, into his presence, his quest for you is concluded. 
and he has what his heart desires because you will spend forever with the God who has committed himself to pursuing you, to have you as his own. There is nothing that brings greater joy to the heart of God than to have you as his child. So never forget the four simple things. He accepts you right where you're at. You don't have to change a thing. He loves you. He forgives you. And he walks with you into the days ahead so you have a different understanding. You are of worth. You are of value. You are precious to the heart of God. That's why you can always celebrate the fact that our God is a pursuing God. Amen.